Welcome to another uh, another episode of One Door at a Time, Concentric Educational Solutions podcast, where we look at the intersection between politics, education, and community. We are in the midst, in the home stretch of the political season, and it is my distinct pre- uh, privilege to have Councilwoman Porter representing the 10th District of Baltimore City uh, as a guest today. Really look forward to having this. She's been so gracious and one, communicating. Thank you so much. Two, you are the only council person on time and you were early. <laughs> yes. Th- that's that's facts. Uh, no shade to uh, my past guest, but she beat you all to it. Uh, so let's hop right into it. Sure. You're native Baltimorean. Yeah. Talk about your background. Like, where'd you grow up? And like, what are some of the early things that, uh, you know I me mean, that really shaped who you are? Yeah, so I grew up in Emerson Village right here in Baltimore City. EV. EV. All day. EV all day. <laughs> you know, it comes out, it comes out a little yes, bit. Yes, yes. You know? But, um, you know, my family lived around the Emerson Village area, Mount Holly area. And so I have, you know, generations here, um, both mother and father, their families live here and in Baltimore City. And people know my family, you know, in that area. Mm-hmm. They know my, my mom's family, um, and they know my dad's family. My dad was an avid basketball player. And so oh, okay. my mom, she was very, you know, vocal with her brothers and sisters in the community. So um, they actually taught me kind of that grit and that yeah. more resilience that, you know, it's just now being coined as Baltimore grit. And Baltimore yes, resilience. yes. Um, that was something that I grew up on. And so growing up in Baltimore, I knew that I wanted to be something different. I'm a okay. vocal um, performance uh, artist by training. So okay. Baltimore School of Performing Arts was kind of like my my entrance into public life. Because Did you know that was going to be your destination? It, I thought it was going to be my destination. So mm. I thought I was going to be a performer um, for, okay. my, for my life. Uh, but I realized very quickly that I wanted to do something else and make some money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so right. um, I transitioned into the sciences. And so from there, um, kind of went through kind of public health, went through medicine. I wanted to be a physician by training. Oh, okay. Um, just what had what I had seen in my family, substance abuse, domestic violence, mm-hmm. that kind of shaped my background. Um, but then when I got to the Army, studying suicidal behavior, I really... Oh, you were in the Army? No. So I was just a civilian. Oh, wow. Army. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I knew that kind of like the the shift needed to happen where I mm-hmm. wanted to do more population level work. And that's when I transitioned into policy. So as you go growing up at EV, uh, you know, one of my first experiences in Baltimore City uh, my first year was at uh, teaching at Forest Park. Yes. Uh, then I went to, which is, has its own history uh, in Baltimore, but then I went to Southwestern High School. Mm-hmm. And it was the very first time that I saw how entrenched neighborhoods were yes. in Baltimore. It was probably my first or second day uh, of school. I was a new assistant principal and we let out. Mm-hmm. And so you're familiar with Southwestern. Yes. Is. And it was the largest student fight mm-hmm. between Baltimore Hilton yes. and Emerson Village. Yes. Right? It's still, it's still yeah, yo, no, like no. That. It's still like that. It's entrenched. It can, it, it's entrenched. Right, so it's entrenched. me being new, I brought the parents in yeah. and realized that the parents had fought. Yeah. Like, it was really generational between yeah. Baltimore Hilton yes. and Emerson and V. Yes. Like, it, 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 it was crazy. Yeah. Right, like, so... Now you go to you go to Baltimore School of the Arts, right? For the Swigs program, yep. Yes, I went there for the Swigs program. So as you go through it, like what it, as, and you start shaping who you want to become. Yeah. How'd you decide on? Because you went undergrad at Towson, right? I did. Yeah. How'd you decide on Towson? Towson was actually my safety school, so I was supposed to go to Howard. Um, okay, the Mecca H. The Mecca. Okay. I was supposed to go there. I was so excited, um, but unfortunately, um, they had lost my entire application. Wow. And I was, you know, I was like, you know, I needed to get into a school pretty quickly. And Towson mm-hmm. was one of my safety schools. And I applied and I got in, got some scholarship money um, and kind of went there for molecular biology and biochemistry. Um, I auditioned for the vocal performance program, but, wow. you know, I knew that I wanted to do something in the sciences. That's those tough majors. Yeah. very. That's tough. a very tough major. Yeah. Um, I can read well. Yeah. <laughs> When you're, when you're coming through, what was Baltimore like in your formative years in like high school? So Baltimore, in my formative years, I would have to say it was culturally relevant. And I say that because that was during the time where K-Swift was out. And oh, yeah, everybody, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, K-Swift yeah, okay, forever. Yeah. 
Yeah. So everybody was, you know, really into club music. Everybody was, you know, really into Baltimore. Yeah. That is where I feel Baltimore kind of got its start. When we talk about Miss Tony, when we yeah. talk about K Swift, when we talk about all of the radio personalities that really shaped where Baltimore was going and how Baltimore is kind of perceived now, mm -hmm. that's where, you know, I grew up in that era. So I grew up with Horns 2003. I, I grew wow. up with, you know, um, K Swift. I grew up with um, uh, Quicksilver, Quicksilver. You know, listen to him on the radio. So I grew up hearing that going to a private high school in East Baltimore. So, you know, my mom would take me early in the morning mm -hmm. to East Baltimore Institute of Notre Dame. So I grew up listening okay. to, to all of them. I grew up really understanding that um, Baltimore is unique. Uh, Baltimore very is very unique. unique. Very unique. Um, I've traveled many places across the world and I have never known, felt, or seen a place like Baltimore. Talk more about like what do you what do you think gives it that distinction? Oh my gosh, it's the neighborhoods and the people. You know, you can go to anywhere in the nation and start talking twos, do's, and news, yep. and they know exactly where you're from. You can start talking about egg custard with the marshmallow, which is like a Baltimore <laughs> stable. You can talk about Mr. G. Yes, yes. You know, these are things that people know about Baltimore. Um, and I actually take a different approach for, as an elected official. So mm -hmm. I lean into that. Facts, you know, facts, yeah. um, there are so many people that talk so negatively about Baltimore, but I lean into, you know, having um, the, 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 the old grandmas watch out for me when I'm walking home yeah. um, from their windows. I talk about the, 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 the young men on the corner that know that knew that I was trying to get a good education and they would make sure that I would stay, Absolutely. you know, stay on the straight and narrow. Um, they talk about the musicians and the art scene here yeah, in Baltimore. Yeah. You know, that's what I choose to dive into. So I remember in undergrad, so I was in undergrad 96 to 2000 at Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And like that is, you know, Drew Hill coming through. Yep. Uh, and I'm just, it's, it's amazing that, you know, I get to Baltimore yes. and it's, it, it, there's, there is that grit that yes. you said that that's, that's been termed now. It's, it's tangible. You, it you, you can feel it and that no matter where you, where you go, like there, there's, a, there's a pool for me wherever I travel, like to get back to Baltimore, it, yes. it's a renewal sometimes, it right? Uh, and just feeling it. And then, you know, you see all the development that has happened, that's happening in, uh, in Baltimore. And it, it's, it, it's. You know, it's a double edged sword sometimes, but uh, it's 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 powerful. So now you're an undergrad. Mm -hmm. Like, tell me some of the what are some of the experiences in undergrad that kind of impacted you? Working four jobs. You Damn. know, yeah. So I I was actually a really hard worker um, because I was on scholarship. So okay. I knew that I had to make the grades, but I knew I also needed to pay my cell phone bill. Yes. So. <laughs> So I knew that I had to work very hard in order mm -hmm. to get there. I was the first person um, in my family to go to college. Mm -hmm. And so having that um, on my back and having that in my brain constantly, mm -hmm. you know, made sure that I showed up eight o'clock in the morning for labs, made sure I stayed late to take advantage of all that Towson had had to offer me. And now I'm on the board of Towson University. So pushing wow. for other first generation African Americans um, or persons of color to actually get to that, get to that realm and get to that table and be comfortable and be supported in a way that will make them flourish. We have about a large majority of people um, their first year, they mm -hmm. leave because yes. it's financial reasons yes. or they just can't keep up with the culture. Mm -hmm. of being in college. And even that, that you know, you're unique in that you actually graduated mm -hmm. in the sciences, mm -hmm. right? Like that doesn't happen. It's yeah. it's like a huge drop off. Huge drop. Right. Uh, with eight girls. Yeah. Like, only one. It's it's a huge drop off. Like mm -hmm. like across the board, it's disproportionate with with uh people of color yes. dropping up from the uh, science. Or switching majors switching if they don't drop enough. Yep. Um like what made you want to stick through it? Yeah. As hard as it may have gotten. Yeah. So I'm not even going. I'm not even going to uh. hold you. It was really <laughs> the money that I would make when I came out of undergrad. So you know, I knew that I had to have a job when I got out of college. I okay. knew that in order to sustain myself, um, I had to do that. My parents were working class parents, and yeah. so 
you know, having that opportunity where they would, you know, pay for everything was just not an option. And they literally did the best that they could to get me to where I needed to go. But mm-hmm. I knew in order for me to take it to the next level, I had to show up in a way that was more adult at 18 than many people kind of many people deal with when they're 28 and 30. Because we, we, you know, we all have a unique stories that mm-hmm. that kind that that ground us, that guide us, that that form us. So now you're going through undergrad, you're getting ready to uh, graduate. Yeah. Like what 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 are you thinking about what to do? Yeah. So my next steps was to get a job. Um, that was like you know my mother. <laughs> My mother, you know, bless her heart, she wanted me to work for the judiciary, work for, you know, get, get a good government job. Good government job, yeah. Um, but I knew that I wanted to continue school. Mm-hmm. I knew that I wanted to work in the sciences, um, possibly in D.C., and okay. that's where I headed. So I went to um, the NIH. Okay, I was okay. there for about five years, developed a program there, worked on Capitol Hill at HHS, so I was able to expand my opportunities with the help of mentors at Telson. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then uh, you go to grad school. I did, yeah. Okay. Where'd you end up going? Morgan State University. The Morgan State University. Shout out to the Bears. Yes. They they stole my my blue and orange. I went to Lincoln. (laughs) Uh, But so, so... What made you uh, go to go to Morgan? Yeah. To continue at Morgan. So I was actually working at the Army at the time, and a young lady there was getting her doctorate program, and I was okay. looking at, you know, I was looking at Hopkins, I was looking at University of Maryland, and she said, "Why don't you consider Morgan?" Mm-hmm. And I said, mm, "I never really consider Morgan." The dean, Doctor um, Doctor Kim Sutnor, mm-hmm. um, she met with me and kind of explained to me the magic of Morgan and being amongst your people at a historically black Absolutely. institution and college what that is like for your lens of your professional career. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I often remind people, Morgan has an exceptional public health program where I was able to get training that, Mm -hmm. you know, people in their entire professional career did not get this type of professional training Mm -hmm. that is culturally competent, that is systemic, and that is also like for persons of color. Morgan, uh, so I went to grad school at Temple. Yes. uh, Which, I consider HBCU just mm-hmm. without the designation yes. or Philly. Uh, then I, I went in to Morgan for my doctorate. Yep. Uh, and it was the people that were the professors yes. that were pouring in at Morgan. Yes. Um, reminded me of Lincoln, mm-hmm. uh, but they were they were producing beasts. Yes. Like really high in 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 so many of the disciplines, mm-hmm. uh, and and really prepping us mm-hmm. uh, with the tangible and intangible skills that we're going to need. Yes. So now you 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 finish Morgan. Yep. Then you go on to another one. I, yeah, I went to University of Maryland. Okay. Um. So I did a master in science and law. So I was mm-hmm. really looking to kind of offset that public health degree with regulatory science, and so. With that degree, I'm able to kind of uh, work on Capitol Hill, work mm-hmm. as a legislative director, write laws, work on laws and policies at the federal, state, or local level. What's shaping you as you go to each of these steps? Like, mm-hmm. what what is what become what is your north star of where you want to go? Financial incentive and the diversity oh, okay. of the jobs that I would get. Okay. Yeah, I would say being an elected official here on the city council is probably my first job where um, I have placed people and purpose ahead of the actual salary of a council person. The f- so first of all, thank you for the vulnerability mm-hmm. and transparency. Mm-hmm. Most people want to say that, and it's facts, right? So yeah. like people you gotta ask- Gotta survive. You know, you know, people ask me now, it's like, <laughs> well, you're a businessman, right? Mm-hmm. Like, do you care? Y- yes, I-, I do, but to do a lot of the work, I have to make money. I have, yes. there has to be, the number one job of a business is to stay in business yes. and then give back. Yes. Uh, so what was your trajectory or what were you thinking about? Because you were talking before we went on air about your unique circumstance at that time of yes. going into a uh, public service. Like yeah. what started making you think about it? Yeah. So I will tell you, one of my mentors, um, Senator Antonio Hayes. Um, Shout out to the noobs. Shout- <laughs> Shout out to the fraternity incorporated. Yes. Um, I remember meeting him and Quentin Lathan, um, which is one of his you know, greatest friends, mm-hmm. um, at ARCO over in Poplar Grove. So, you know, with a 15 yeah. and a 23, so where they ended up, uh-huh. ARCO used to meet there. And I met with him and I was just, you know, kind of lamenting what was happening in my community. Mm-hmm. And he said, what are you going to do about it? And where were you living at? The, where were so you? I was actually living um, in, in Mount Vernon. At the you were in Mount Vernon? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. And he said, what are you going to do about it? Mm-hmm. And folks that know me know that you can't challenge me and not, you know, 
I'm going to show up every mm-hmm. time. So I think he knew that. Uh-huh. And that, that kind of started my entrance into public service. And I used to be known as the girl that used to follow Antonio around mm-hmm. at all the community meetings. So I shadowed him. And I, he's an OG. He's, he's an OG in the oh, game. Right. And I definitely respect his opinion. Um, and, you know, his policy issues uh-huh. on a lot of things. Um, now we're at a point where he like he comes to me as like, Pete oh. Porter, what do you think about this? Yeah. So he comes to me as a peer now, but I definitely still hold um, him and Quinn and Anthony Jones um, Mm -hmm. in very high regard um, with regard to like how I shape my policy and how I execute and just kind of show up as an elected official. But he said, what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. I started um, researching what I could do about it. Mm. And so I ran the first time for um, Democratic State Central Committee. Oh, wow. Okay. And, you know, I really... At the time, I really did not understand what that position and how important that position is. And I lost. Mm. Mm. (laughs) And I remember, you know, Hayes came and got me and said, you know, take it on the chin. Hmm. Do better next time. The next time I did it, um, it was 14 people. And usually with Central Committee, they kind of just go down by seven. I was number 14 and I made it up to number four. So that means that people had to search for me. And so I I, kind of just delve right into um, community engagement and and community service and what public service really needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you 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 run in 2020, uh, 2020, 2020. Mm -hmm. you win. Yes. Crowded race, crowded race in the midst of the pandemic. Yes. What are some of the early lessons that you learned uh, when you when you became elected that you didn't expect? Once I became elected? Yes. That I, oh my gosh, um, you don't know everything. Mm. Um, You know, one of the things that I often uh, remind candidates is that people that have ran for these offices, secured these offices, they got there by an approach. Whether it's a good approach or whether it's Mm -hmm. a bad approach, they got there by an approach and they were successful. Mm -hmm. Learn from them. Hmm. Take an opportunity to talk to people that agree with you and take an opportunity to talk with people that don't agree with you. And that's exactly Hmm. when I got in. um, I ran in a crowded race of nine um, very competent community people in Hmm. South Baltimore. And I took it as an opportunity to meet with each of them or, you know, extend the opportunity to meet with each of, each of them to figure out how we can work together. And I will tell you, now that I'm running for re-election, mm-hmm. um, a majority of competitors back in 2020, mm-hmm. they are now endorsing my campaign, my, my re-election campaign, because I took an opportunity to not, um, to not, you know, just discard them mm-hmm. and not keep them into the fold of District 10, because obviously, they had something to say. Absolutely. And Absolutely. being a humble leader enough to mm-hmm. know and to work with people that you may or may not necessarily agree with. So that was the first thing I mm-hmm. learned when I got in. Um, you don't know everything. Mm-hmm. Number two, be kind to people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you know? Thank you. Thank you. I, I often remind people as a former staffer, I often remind people power is not displayed by what you say. Power is displayed by what you do. Okay. And so you don't need to, you know, uh, uh, bulldoze your way through, you know, and, uh, you know, you don't need to bulldoze your way through. Take a step back and figure out, one, who really holds the power, because I will often remind people it's those executive assistants. <laughs> and so, you know, they're the one, they're the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers yeah. and, and be nice. And you never know who is there going to help you to the, to the next level. And I will tell you over my four years, it has been those people, those hardworking people in city agencies that have made um, District 10 the success that it is today. And it's, it's shown immense growth mm-hmm. in, in, in the stuff that you the stuff that you have done and continue to do. Thank you. Um, what What are some of the challenges that you ran into that you didn't expect your, uh, as an elected official? Um, being one of the youngest uh, black women on the council, um, wow. we are wow. we're served by four women on the council right now. We yes. have vice chair um, Sharon Green Middleton, an mm-hmm. amazing, amazing mentor. Okay. We have chairwoman Danny McCray, another amazing mentor that has helped mm-hmm. navigate me. We have um, councilwoman Odette Ramos, who in her own right has been kind of an OG in the uh-huh. housing game. Mm-hmm. Um, she has helped me as well. Um, being able to kind of just sit and learn mm-hmm. and hear from them 
that was probably like the biggest kind of like lessons learned okay. as an African-American woman. Because most people think, and you know, the former councilman, Ed Reisinger, we were actually at a site visit. Most people think I was the admin assistant. Mm. And he actually got me into a posture uh. of leading people. Mm. And so that was probably the biggest challenge, like leaning into that posture um, as a young African-American woman. Wow. Going into the home stretch mm -hmm. uh, of the election, at least with the primary, but mm -hmm. yeah. what do you see being a native Baltimorean for your life, uh, entire life? Yeah. What do you see as the biggest opportunities and the biggest challenges facing facing us, uh, you know, in the yeah. in the near future? In the near future, mm -hmm. I would have to say apathy and empowerment. Mm. Um, when I talk to voters, they have such apathy for city officials mm -hmm. and Baltimore city government in general. Mm. And so changing that narrative um, to get them to believe in Baltimore mm. city again, um, that's probably the most recent challenge that I believe as a people mm -hmm. we're gonna have to overcome. Secondarily, when we're talking about Baltimore keeping its grits and its resilience and its mm -hmm. culture, that's probably going to be the secondary um, challenge that I see for us moving forward. And it's an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity for us to lean into what so many people for decades have been saying about Baltimore yeah. across the nation. But we don't see here in Baltimore. I, I Again, I've traveled across the nation and other cities and they look to Baltimore as a leader. Mm -hmm. They believe that Baltimore is doing cutting edge work, but we have to make sure that our people here are feeling it and they see the cutting edge work that we are doing across the nation. And Baltimore is so unique because we 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 are urban we're yeah. city. We're small enough that, you know, so many people, yes. it's, you know, small and more. Right. Um, and there's just I mean, it's just tremendous growth opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the things that we're seeing now, like the intersection, um, like with education. Yes. Uh, it's always whether it be, you know, education as a hot topic, yes. economic development or opportunity, healthcare. You know, do you see that? The, do you see any uh, correlation between education and public health? Oh, most definitely. Um, there's there's an incredible correlation when we're talking about, and I mean, COVID was the prime example. Yes. Um, when you had people really having conversations at their dinner table about who their primary care provider is, yeah. um, public health has been saying that for decades. Mm -hmm. um, having an opportunity to make a plan um, to access, you know, hospital institutions, access mm -hmm. different items related to your health care. So transportation, education, having the literacy yes. to understand. Yes. That has been talked about for decades, but it kind of you know, intersected during COVID and people really began to take it seriously. Yeah, I mean, we've been having conversations around, you know, every there's in education sphere, there's this big, you know, the buzzwords about chronic absenteeism. People, yes. school, students aren't, aren't, aren't just coming. It's always been an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but I had an opportunity to have Councilman Stokes on here yes. and we talked about it. And it's not a chronic absenteeism, students not coming to school is not just an education mm -hmm. issue, it's a public health issue. Yes, if they're it is. not, like there's so many intersections there and not trying to combat these things me. Uh, no, mm -hmm. in isolation, yes. right? And, and how can we bring the education sector to, to and the government sector mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the private sector mm -hmm. into one and, re and really talk about what we're doing to support young people, yes. right? Like, and being very intentional and very open and very collaborative uh, yes. in that space. Um, what are the say three things that you you'll focus on for your next term that you want so for my next term because you're going to get you got to get reelected thank so. you my next term i'm going to be focusing on economic development um uh -huh. this groundwork for my first term was really about resetting um city services and really how people view district 10 south baltimore mm -hmm. when people think of south baltimore they think of districts 1 and 11. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, this yeah, was yes. an opportunity for the 13 communities surrounding um you know in district 10 surrounding kind of like that that area in south baltimore to get some love mm -hmm. too um so resetting that whole narrative resetting city services how people see 
um, District 10 in South Baltimore, mm -hmm. having that economic footprint. So that was a huge, huge issue that in the latter half of the four years, we really, really focused on. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is going to be environmental sustainability. So mm -hmm. and during my first term, we really leaned into um, taking advantage of environmental sustainabil sustainability within our communities okay. and that advocacy. So we're talking about going up against coal. You know, mm. communities down in Curtis Bay have coal literally on their homes, which are from a number of industrial. Yes. yes. Yeah. From a number of industrial methods and really is by city ordinance. Yeah. Um, in the next term, we're really going to be focusing on how we can advocate at our state and federal level in order to make those to make those environmental changes happen. Wow. I want to thank you for stopping by. You've been more than gracious. Thank you for taking my text working uh, with our assistant, I mean, through your assistant, like just getting it on the books and just being kind, Thank right? You. It was interesting, um, like this 2023-24 has kind of been a whirlwind uh, with the investment that we got and all that stuff. And it's like these issues were always persistent, yeah. uh, always had an opportunity to connect, but people being very kind. Uh, you know, when I asked Councilman Stokes, I said, who on the council can, can I get? I, I, he was, you were the very first person he named. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's OG. But, you know, I, I just want to thank you. Uh, continued success. Thank you me. have concentric support. Uh, continue to do the great work. Uh, and thank you for your service and thank dedication you. to Baltimore. Thank you. Huh? I appreciate you. Thank you for joining us for uh, another episode of One Door at a Dime. Uh, Concentric Educational Solutions uh, podcast with the intersection of community education and politics. Shout out as always to Atlas Restaurant Group. You can catch them in, I think they have 34, 35. <laughs> Every week it changes. Shout out to uh, Alex and his brother for uh, supporting us. You can always, uh, as always, you can look at, go to concentric.world and get all of our social media. Until next time, I'm David Heber, your host. Be blessed. Thank Be you. Blessed. Mm -hmm.